afternoon. My name is Ali Kujuri, and uh, I'm uh, an adjunct professor at the engineering science department and uh, one of the organizers of this lecture series. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Sharam Maribani and also Ms. Kate Kat Lab that uh, who have been uh, helping me in, in organizing this lecture series. On behalf of our department and the School of Science and Technology, let me thank you all and also our speaker uh, uh, for this, uh, 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 to attend this uh, sixth lecture for this academic year and 141st lecture in the series since we started in uh, 2006. Two uh, brief uh, 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 information that uh, pizza is going to arrive at uh, 5.30 right after the lecture and also uh, the next lecture will be uh, on the 7th of uh, February, and I'm right now trying to uh, basically get the speaker, a good speaker, uh, hopefully from Keysight Technology as they, they usually uh, sponsor uh, this lecture series. Uh, about our uh, <coughs> lecture today, uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Salim. Uh, an assistant professor at the engineering science department, and uh, his, uh, the title of his talk is Metal Services Engineering Electromagnetic Wavefronts. Dr. Salem is, uh, uh, received his uh, PhD from New Jersey Institute of Technology, Newark, New Jersey, in 2009. Prior, prior to joining uh, Sonoma State University, he was a lecturer with the University of Idaho, Moscow, Idaho. He has several years of uh, postdoctoral experience with uh, Polytechnic Montreal in Quebec, uh, Canada, and also uh, King uh, Abdullah University of Science and Technology uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Dr. Salem's research focuses on electromagnetic propagation and scattering phenomena and wave matter interaction. He is particularly interested in metal surface application in wavefront shaping and, and conventional waves and beams such as localized wave waves. So uh, let's applause. Uh, <laughs> for Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kujuri, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see most of you again. And well, I have a relatively long lecture for you today. Hopefully, we'll finish before the pizza arrives. Don't panic if the pizza arrives before we're done. So the topic of my talk today is meta surfaces which is a relatively new area in electromagnetics research that combines the benefits of what are called metamaterials with the economic and practical application side of engineering. So before I start, I would like to mention a couple of papers that appeared back to back in a science magazine back in 2006. And both of those articles promised that using a magical type of material, we can make things disappear. We can create an invisibility clock. The idea of invisibility clocks is not new. It's been in popular culture for a long time. Even before the 1933 The Invisible Man movie, back even it goes back to the Chinese and ancient Greek history. So in 2006, that's more than 12 years ago, the prediction of electromagnetic clocks was made. So now I think it's not a bad time to ask, where are the actual invisibility clocks? And the short answer to this is, they're not there, and unfortunately, they will never be there. So what was promised back there in 2006 is not realizable. But what I would like to give you an idea of as we go through this talk is 
why it's not realizable and what are the actual realizable benefits of those magical mechanisms. All right, so to start, I'd like to go over some basics, how materials and metamaterials interact with the electromagnetic field, what are the limitations of metamaterials, and how metasurfaces emerged from those disappointments that came with metamaterials. After that, I will show how those metamaterials are modeled how they are fabricated, at least within the research group I worked with. And finally, I'll show some applications and give a future overlook of what I think might be the future of this topic. All right, so to start, perhaps let me first define what is the electromagnetic field. What is a field in nature? The example I would like to give is of temperature. If you have a candle there, and you try to measure the temperature, you're going to see high temperature in the vicinity of the flame, and as you go farther away, the temperature will drop. But the point here is at every point in space, you can measure something that you call the temperature. So temperature is a field that permeates space. Similar to the temperature, the electric field and the magnetic field are also properties of space itself you can measure a value for the electric field and the magnetic field at every point in space. And similar to the flame that raises the temperature locally and then this temperature diffuses away from the flame, we also have sources that raise the value of the electric field and the magnetic field. These are what we call the charges, the electric charges and the electric current. And charges come in two flavors, positive and negative. Perhaps you can make the analogy that flame and ice cube, one of them raises the temperature, the other one lowers the temperature. The way charges and current interact with the electric and magnetic field are described through Maxwell's equations. So in Maxwell's equations, those D, B, E, and H are names for the electric and magnetic field. This rho here and J, these are the charges and the currents. So the presence of charges and currents give rise to change in the electric and magnetic field. But this relationship goes both ways. If there's a change in value of the electric and magnetic field, and if there's a charge there, then that charge is going to experience a force acted on it by the electric and magnetic field. So charges create electric and magnetic field, electric and magnetic field act on the charge. That's the basic dynamics between the matter that we know, the matter that carries charge, and the electromagnetic field that permeates space. If we take the simplest example of a molecule, a molecule by itself is neutral. It contains positive and negative charges, but if we are far away from that molecule, we see a neutral particle. However, if we subject that molecule to an electric field, the electric field would try to push away the negative charges in that molecule and pull the positive. So it would deform the molecule, and then we can see a difference in charge there. And if that electric field comes from an electromagnetic wave, where the field oscillates positive, negative, positive, negative, then that deformation in the molecule would be something like a wobbling. The negative and positive charges would go far and close to each other in a periodic fashion. And since now the charges go back and forth, they create a small current like, which in turn radiates electromagnetic field back to the environment. That's pretty much, that's the very simple explanation of how materials interact with the electromagnetic field. This is why, for example, when you see a beam of light hitting a water surface, it refracts in because the water molecules interact with the electromagnetic field. 
So these are the natural molecules of material. Metamaterial are artificial molecules where we can control the behavior of the charges as the electric and magnetic field interact with them. So in that particular example here, by creating this metallic artificial molecule, we force the charges to move in certain patterns and accordingly create electric and magnetic fields that are not naturally created by the regular molecules. All right, so as we said, there's electric field and magnetic field, and we describe the way material interacts with the electric field by the electric permittivity, denoted here as epsilon, and the way the material interacts with the magnetic field by the magnetic permittivity. And for the most of natural material, they, for, they fall in the first quadrant there where both the magnetic permeability and the electric permittivity are positive. This is the wood, the glass, water, pretty much all the natural dielectrics that we see. A particular case is where you have the permittivity is equal to one and the permeability is equal to one. That's vacuum. And when an electromagnetic wave falls onto such dielectric material, it refracts into the material but keeps propagating there. In the second quadrant, we have plasmas or metals at very high frequencies. They have a positive magnetic response, similar to the natural material, but they have a negative electric response. So in such materials, the waves, the electromagnetic waves, do not propagate inside the material. They reflect back. In the third and the fourth quadrant, we have magnetic plasma, or some of the ferrites. These have positive electric response, similar to natural material, but a negative magnetic response. And again, in such materials, waves do not propagate inside the material, but they reflect back. So all these materials do occur in nature. Still, the most common ones are the ones in the first quadrant, but plasmas occur, magnetic plasma occur. In the last quadrant, here we have material with both negative electric and negative magnetic response. Those materials do not occur in nature. As far as we know, we have never found a natural material that behaves in such ways. But the interesting part about those materials, if they exist, that the electromagnetic waves would still propagate inside them, but they would refract in the opposite direction to the normal material. And matter of fact, the first person who predicted the existence of those materials was a Russian scientist back in 1968. But because the paper was published in Russian, it did not receive attention outside of the Soviet Union at that time until the year 2000, where another group in England started publishing again on the same topic. So when people talk about metamaterials, most of the time they refer to materials in that last quadrant, with materials that are not found in nature. So to go through the short journey of how metamaterials are developed, we start by looking at what's called artificial dielectrics. These are materials that belong to the top half in that diagram. So they both have positive magnetic response, but they could have either positive or negative electric response. And artificially, those materials could be created in a very simple way. Matter of fact, researchers created those materials even back in the 40s, just by using an arrangement of metallic spheres or even metallic wires, that material that consists of metal 
effectively behaves as a dielectric. And even though this technology is very old, it's now being revived for terahertz waves. But that's another interesting topic, not terahertz, maybe for another lecture some other time. But that simple technology of using methods to mimic the behavior of dielectrics is being revived. In terms of printed circuit realization of the materials, those artificial dielectrics could be realized using strips of wires or cross-shaped printed circuit materials. Now we can take a look at the right half of the diagram. These are the magnetic materials. So in both cases, the electric response is positive, but the magnetic response could be either positive or negative. And the first time a magnetic material was reported in experiment had this shape. It's like a small circuit with an opening there. And what does this metallic circuit does is when you have an electric field impinging on the circuit, it forces the current to go around the circuit and current that goes in a loop has a magnetic response. So this particle called a split ring resonator creates an artificial magnetic response from an electric field. And once this particle was discovered in 1999, a lot of research was done to further the types of artificial magnetic material. Now for the last quadrant, these are the negative index materials. And if you search online for negative index material or metamaterial, you will probably see an image similar to this one, where they claim that this is the regular water, you have the straw here, and you see the straw inner fraction. But if that water was a meta water, then you'd see a straw bent in the opposite direction. This is a completely wrong description of metamaterial. If this water was metamaterial, it would not refract the waves in that way. What you would see if this was an actual meta water, you would see the straw outside the glass. And I'll show you how it happens in the next slide. But the way to create those negative index material is basically by combining the artificial dielectric materials, the wires, and the artificial magnetic materials, the split ring resonator. And there are very successful experimental results that demonstrate the negative refraction of those metamaterials. Right, so what's the appeal of those negative index materials? One of the applications is to create a perfect lens. A perfect lens creates an image of the object at the other side of the lens. How is this different from regular lenses? Regular lenses cannot fully reconstruct an actual perfect image of the object. That's because in order to reconstruct the image, you need to transfer all the frequency components of that that are emitted by the object to the other side. And for regular materials, certain types of waves called evanescent waves cannot be transferred successfully from one side of the lens to the other side. But with meta material, with a perfect negative index material, you can actually recreate a full perfect version of that object on the other side. In practice, when people try to do <coughs> construct a perfect lens out of a meta material, they achieved a much better resolution compared to a regular lens. As you can see here, the red curve is the regular lens, and it has a certain width. This is the resolution. But if you construct the lens with a meta material, then you get a narrower width, which means a better resolution. Think of this width as the pixel size, for example, in terms of an image. The smaller the pixel size, the higher your resolution. It's still not perfect. It's not, it's not a perfect zero width 
line, but it's much better compared to regular ones. The other appeal of negative index material is in terms of invisibility clocks. This is what started or what ignited the hype about metamaterials. If you think about how light travels through different materials, it follows Fermat's principle. And Fermat's principle tells you that the light would take the shortest path to go from point A to point B. But shortest path depends on the material. The length inside the material is different than the length outside the material. So here, for example, the light wave goes to this point and then refracts inside the material because the length of this path is shorter than the length of the direct path. This idea was leveraged to create a shell around the material that would trick the light into thinking the shortest path is just to go around that enclosure and not interact with it. And by doing so, you're hiding whatever is inside that enclosure from interacting with light and effectively rendering invisible. That's the basic principle behind the invisibility clock. You're rerouting the light waves around the object to avoid interacting with the object. That's one example of the earliest realized electromagnetic clocks. And you can see here, this is the object. If it's not cloaked, then the electromagnetic waves interact with the object. And you can see the shadow behind the object. But when it's cloaked, you can see a great reduction in the shadow behind the object. It's not a perfect invisibility clock, but it's reducing the visibility of the object. Several other types of invisibility clocks were devised. This one is called a carpet clock. So it looks like a fake carpet. And if you hide an object here <coughs> in that enclosure, whatever electromagnetic wave trying to detect that object would reflect back in a manner as if there was nothing here. The third type is called an active clock. This, or if you wish, it has a little bit of cheating. It senses the incoming electromagnetic wave and then generates its own electromagnetic field that cancels the effect of this incident. So again, it renders the object almost invisible, but in an active fashion. Right. So, so far it looks good, metamagenes look promising. However, once more research was done, one of the main disappointments were that the bandwidth where we can realize such metamaterial is extremely narrow. So in practice, if you want to create a cloak to hide a human being, like a shell of diameter of two meters, for example, then at the visible lay range, the best you can do, the best you can do is to hide that person from almost a single wavelength. But any other wavelength next to that, like, for example, you can hide that person from the color green. But all the other colors would still interact with that person. The second disappointment was in terms of losses. In order for those metamaterials to be physical, they need to be causal. Causal means the response of the material occurs after they interact with the incoming electromagnetic wave. And for this to be true, those metamaterials need to be highly lossy. In addition to that, metamaterials, as you have seen in the structure of those cloaks, are extremely difficult to fabricate, and they are very costly. So at that point, using metamaterial negative index materials, does not seem to be a very appealing engineering solution. The solution to that came from the idea of metasurface, reducing the three-dimensional metamaterials to a thin sheet of metamaterial. That way, we reduce the fabrication difficulty. Instead of needing to fabricate or structure a 3D material, it's now just a surface. 
reducing the losses. Now the wave does not interact with a large volume of lossy material, but interacts with a thin surface. And also has other advantages, as we'll see as we go on. So the research in this area started, again, back in the beginning of the century with surfaces that act as filters, called frequency selective surfaces. Those surfaces could let some frequencies pass through and prevent others from going through. This idea was later on worked on by changing the shapes, the patterning on those surfaces. And recently, certain meta surfaces were realized. For example, this meta surface here can refract the light in an anomalous fashion. Here we have an incident beam, but as the beam interacts with this surface, it exits at an angle. These are the frequency selective surfaces. They act as filters in a sense. They could be pass band or stop band. And these have been there for a long time. The additional part that meta surfaces provided is they are not necessarily periodic. Those frequency selective surfaces are periodic structures. They have the same pattern repeated over and over again. Meta surfaces could have different patterns in different parts of the surface, which allows them to control other aspects. It's not just the filter, it can control the magnitude, can control the phase, the polarization, change the direction of the wave, and in some cases can create an asymmetric transmission. It would let the wave transmit from one side to the other, but not in the reverse direction. All right, so Next, I'll briefly go over how we mathematically describe the meta surfaces and what type of transformations they can do to electromagnetic waves. And we'll show you some of the techniques that were used in my research group to fabricate and measure those meta surfaces. So, the way we model the meta surface is as a discontinuity in the electromagnetic field. And skipping all the mathematical details, this is the Maxwell's equation, the equation that describes the interaction between currents and charges with the electric and magnetic field, but in the presence of a discontinuity. And from this Maxwell's equations, we devised a relationship between the electric and magnetic field on both sides of the meta surface and parameters called the susceptibility, which describe the physical parameters of the meta surface. All right, so what you see here, delta H, that's the difference between the magnetic field on both sides of the surface. H, AV, is the average of the magnetic field on both sides of the surface. Similarly, for the electric field, here we have the difference between the electric field on both sides and the average of the electric field on both sides. And those chi's here, these are the susceptibilities that describe the physical response of the surface. So let me put things in colors. Maybe perhaps it will be a bit easier. This is how these two equations look like when expanded in matrix form. So if we want to use a meta surface to transform an incident electromagnetic wave into another transmitted wave, then we know the difference between the fields and we know the average of the fields. What we are looking for is this large matrix that describes the physical parameters of the meta surface. And as you can see here, these are the knowns are only four quantities the electric field, the magnetic field, but the unknowns are 16 quantities. So this is an underdetermined system. We cannot directly find those 16 parameters right from these four parameters. So we need to do something extra. Either we can force some of those parameters to go to zero, or we can allow this meta surface, a single meta surface, to operate on four different sets of 
electric and magnetic fields to do multiple transformations. Let's take a look at the first case where we can force some of those excess parameters to go to zero. Some of those enforcement come from physical requirements, such as there is a process if you want that surface to behave in the same direction whether the waves comes from the left or comes from the right. Another condition comes from the losslessness. If we want the surface to be lossless, or if we want the surface not to be active, then there are also certain constraints that are imposed on those susceptibilities. In this example here, we look at only one of those parameters for a meta surface that acts as a lens. So if we can realize a meta surface with these susceptibility parameters, an incident plane wave would collimate at the other side of that meta surface. And if you look at the imaginary part here, the imaginary part represents either a loss or a gain. You can see that this meta surface, in order to operate as a collimating lens, requires both a lossy part and a gain part. So this means that meta surface needs to have an active element and to have some absorbing element. So one of the things we worked on is we looked into how can we change that? How can we try to optimize the susceptibility profile such that to minimize the need for loss and gain. Also, we want to try to make the variation in the surface as smooth as possible. If the change occurs at every micrometer, that would be a very difficult surface to fabricate. But if the change is gradual, this is a more realizable surface. And using a lot of simulation, this is what we have achieved at the end. So now you can see a very smooth profile in the read part and no gain in the imaginary part and only very small losses. So that's almost a lossless surface with a very smooth profile. And this surface was actually fabricated and measured as I'll show you later on. Right, so now how to realize those actual parts of the surface. For this, we divide the surface into cells. Let's think of pixels in an image. And each cell contains three elements right behind each other. The dimensions of each cell is about one-fifth of the wavelength by one-fifth of the wavelength and has a thickness of one-tenth of a wavelength. So what we did is we created those cells in simulation, changed the different parameters. As you can see here, there are length of this part, length of that part, thickness, etc., etc. a lot of parameters. And we simulated almost over 7,000 different configurations of those particles and recorded their electromagnetic behavior, the susceptibility profile. Now we have a database that contains the properties of those 7,000 particles. And once we have the susceptibility profile we are looking for, we can go to that database and find out what type of particle matches that behavior and use that to construct the meta surface. After that, we even started creating something called supercells. So combining the different particles next to each other and then simulating this large supercell find the behavior of the big cell. So that's, that's the general process we start with. We start by finding the susceptibility profile from the Maxwell's equation that describe the discontinuity in the electromagnetic field. We discretize the surface because the susceptibility profile is a continuous function. We go to the database and look up the corresponding shape for each pixel on the surface, fabricate, and then test. And for testing, we built this nice little contraption here. What you see in there, that's the meta surface. What's around there in blue, these are all absorbers. 
Number one is a transmitting antenna that sends the wave, and there's another antenna there at the back that scans vertically and horizontally and measures the field that passes through the data surface. All right, what type of applications can we do with data surfaces? One of them is the refraction that I just demonstrated before. And this data surface was built back in 2015 by a group at Michigan University. They built a data surface that contains 12 different unit cells and would refract a normally incident beam to an angle of 45 degrees. So if you're looking from the top here, instead of seeing the beam coming right at you, you would only see it if you are looking with an angle of 45 degrees. Another application I worked on personally is to enhance the power extraction from sources embedded inside meat. So if this here, for example, is an antenna or a light source that is embedded inside a dielectric, let's say a silicon, for example, as the waves exit from that light source, part of them would refract outside, but other parts would <coughs> reflect back in and get trapped inside that material. So by putting an appropriate meta surface on the outer side of that dielectric, we can extract that power that otherwise would get trapped in. And here you can see a simulation of the regular configuration. Here's the source. This is the dielectric part. And you can see a lot of the energy is trapped inside the dielectric. But by placing the meta surface here, now you can see a lot of that energy now gets released and propagates outside. Another interesting application is to create a meta surface that acts as a switch. So that's the surface. If you have an incident wave, you get a certain refraction. But if you send another wave from another direction, it can switch <coughs> the direction of the transmitted wave. And that's the actual fabricated surface, and these are the measurements. So what you see here, red and blue, these are those incident waves just by themselves. But if you combine them together, you can see that you get no transmission outside of the surface. So you can see here. A third application is asymmetric transmission. So you're creating a surface that would let the waves pass in one direction, but not in the opposite direction. And this was created by using some electronics there. It's not a pure electromagnetic structure where you have antennas that receive the waves from one side, let them go through the electronic part, and that would only let the waves transmit from one side, as you can see here. But if you try to send the waves from the opposite side, the transmission is one thousandth of what you get from the opposite side. Another interesting application is, this one is a flat periscope. Periscope is a device that's used in submarines. You have this tube that receives light from the top, sends it down, and then you can look at it. What we have created here is a flat periscope where you get an incident wave that gets trapped on the surface of the meta surface, is propagated to the other end, and then released from the surface. And that's the fabricated surface, and that's the measurement. Here we have the incident wave that gets trapped on the surface and then is released from the other end. There are also other applications done by other groups. One of them is the beam squinting reduction. This type of antenna is called the leaky wave antenna. As you send the electromagnetic energies through that antenna, it would radiate at a certain angle. But as you increase the frequency, for example, if you have a modulation, then the angle of the radiation is going to change with the frequency. As you can see here, as you increase the frequency, the angle of radiation changes. By placing an appropriate meta surface on top of that antenna, you can reduce that effect, that squinting effect. 
you can minimize the change in the angle of the change in coordinates. Another application includes the surface wave antenna. This is another type of meta surface where you don't have an incident wave that is transmitted through the surface, but you connect the surface directly to a power source. And then, as you can see here, this surface can propagate the waves along its surface and then radiate from here. One more application is to coat transmission lines with meta surfaces to reduce crosstalk between different lines. All right, so to sum up, I will give like an overview of the whole process of meta materials, what's been done so far, and what are the possible research opportunities in the future, and finally, some of the potential application maps for meta materials. So what I'm going to show here, it's called the Hype Cycle. It's developed by a company called Gartner, and it maps how the expectations change with time for any new technology. The cycle, I mean, I don't know why they call it a cycle. It's not really a cycle, it's just a curve. But you can apply the same curve to any new technology. And it would be pretty much true. So the cycle starts with what's called the technology trigger. This is when the new technology catches attention. In the case of metamaterials, it was this perfect lens that was introduced in the lecture back in 2000. This got people excited about the idea, the potential applications. And the next part of the cycle, this is called the peak of inflated expectations. This is where people think that metamaterials are going to solve the world problems. And this happened when the demonstration of the invisibility clock was made. People thought that metamaterials could pretty much do everything. After that, the curve starts to drop until it reaches the trough of disillusionment. And the trigger for this drop here was more research that was done and showed all the disadvantages of metamaterials, like the high losses, like the very small bandwidth. So this happened around 2010. And at that time, before that, around 2006, you could easily find hundreds, even thousands of research paper published on meta materials. Around 2010, that number dropped to a few tens maximum. But that's not the end of the story. After that comes the slope of enlightenment. This is when people realize that, yes, it's not going to solve everything, but it's not the worst thing in the world. And in my opinion, this part, the slope of enlightenment, this came about when meta surfaces were introduced. Because they got rid of most of the disadvantages of the meta materials, but again, they have their own limitations as well. The last part of the hype cycle, this is called the plateau of productivity. This is where meta materials would become part of our everyday life. I don't think we have reached that part yet, but I think we are pretty close to it. And as an example, I'll show you some of the available technologies, some of the companies that work in meta materials. One of the biggest companies is Kaimeta. It's in Redmond, Washington. And what they produce are flat antennas for communication with satellite. What you see here on top of this SUV, that white hexagon, that's the equivalent of a 12 meter dish antenna, reduced to this flat disc. Another company, the Meta Material Technologies, these took the Meta surfaces to the optical range and what they created are very high quality optical filter, particularly for green laser. And they sold this technology to Boeing to cover the windshield of their airplanes to prevent laser attacks. 
And what you can see here, this is a be their glasses that are covered with their NATO surface. And what you see there, this is a 300 milliwatt screen laser. And it's almost completely reflected. Nothing reaches the screen behind the glasses. Recently, this company, this company is located in Canada, in Dartmouth. But recently, they acquired another company here in the Bay Area. I currently do not remember the name, but if anybody's interested, please get in touch with me. I'll give you the name of that company. Other companies that work in Meta Materials, Gem in Florida, Maryland. This is one of the big defense in the, uh, contractors. And what you see here, this is a flat radar. So instead of that large radar that rotates around to detect, they have a flat radar using, again, a NATO surface. Similarly, Ecodyne in Bellevue, Washington, they have also developed a, almost a pocket size radar. So this small device here compared to the iPhone, this acts as a full-blown radar. There are other companies that work in Meta materials as well, like Raytheon, like um, Northrop Grumman. But they don't produce products for the public yet. So I think we are almost there in terms of reaching this plateau of productivity, but we are not fully there yet. And I think there are still some opportunities for research in the area of metamaterials. In particular, what would be a systematic approach to design and know those particles that we can put together to construct meta surfaces? How can we integrate active elements with meta surfaces to create functions that are not possible with the conventional passive meta surfaces? How can we leverage nonlinearities of the material to enhance the functionality of meta surfaces? Finally, this is what I think could be the future of meta material applications. Dispersion engineering, this is what's being done so far in terms of filters, in terms of reducing the sizes of antennas, and this is going to continue with flat lenses, flat metamaterial devices, flat modulators. This would be one large part of the possible applications of meta surfaces. Nonlinear meta materials, I think this would be the next main applications for meta materials. Integrating meta surface technologies with existing technologies such as CMOS, for example. This might provide some new applications, especially as electronics now go towards higher and higher speeds. Meta surfaces might be of benefit there. And finally, reconfigurable meta surfaces. We have something like a software defined meta surface that changes its function depending on its program. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, one thing. Can you pass uh, some uh, name of some of the materials, common materials that are used to make the surface? Some of the common materials used to make the surface. For example, in the surfaces that we have built within my research group, we just used the conventional FR4 laminates. So it's dielectric with copper cladding. We do the pattern on the copper cladding, and that would create the surface. Thank you. Well, for the ranges of frequencies that we were interested in, between 9 gigahertz and up to 20 gigahertz. For optical meta surfaces, such as the ones developed by meta material technologies, they use thin films and they use a uh, silver nanoparticles pattern. So the, the, the part here is silver nanoparticles. So for example, if you want to make lenses, very thin lenses and so on, that's what you use for the... Right, yes. You use this resin with the silver nanoparticles. So depending upon how uh, these, uh, or shall we say, molecules of the surface are, I mean, covering that, Right, depending on so the pattern they are put in, they can create this function. Different focal point. Right. Yeah. 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 The 
MTI application on the lens, um, what, what's the downside of that? Is that? Does it attenuate optical frequencies also to a certain extent? Or I know it's expensive, but... Uh, well, the, the, the good thing is it's, it's really very narrow band, so yeah. it almost attenuates only the green. The downside is the glass looks a bit tinted, so it looks a bit orangish. That's the downside. Yeah, uh, let's say that uh, when the police is at their uh, cars or whatever for speed, is there, uh, do you think that there may be a time that uh, when they cover the car or they uh, thing with some uh, metal, uh, metal surface material, then uh, I mean, the police cannot detect them or whatever? Well, unfortunately, yes. If, if the police is going to only depend on the radar to find the car. Right. Because the radar works at a very specific frequency. And for that particular frequency, yes, you can cloak the car from the radar. But if the policemen use their eyesight, they're going to see. But the point is that they cannot prove it. If you use their eyesight, they cannot <coughs> prove it in their court. That's, right. That's, <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yeah. Well, yes, for, for a radar, you can completely cloak a car. Okay. Yeah, one of the applications you mentioned that caught my interest is the compact mixer. Right. Do you think you could uh, fabricate uh, That's a good question. That was one of the last top research topics we started working on before I left the research group in Montreal. And I'm not aware how far they have developed that idea, but we were working on that. And at least theoretically, it seemed like it's possible. So from a theoretical point of view, yes. From a practical point of view, uh, I don't have a That would be really desirable because in semiconductors, there's a limit to the range of the voltage where you maintain the square law behavior. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, that could be something if any of the students are interested in research here, maybe we can look into that. Yes? So, so can it be used in steering waves as in, I guess, like what's being used in MIMO? Actively steering waves, like change the direction, like reconfigurable surfaces. Right. That would be something for the future. This is what I put on the map here. That would go in that part. For now, all the passive surfaces can only steer the wave in one direction. But to actively change the direction of the wave, this would require something else. So for an electromagnetic wave, can you create an electromagnetic Are laser attacks that common they have to? It's extremely common, more than you think they are. The statistics they showed us when we collaborated with them were horrible. Yes. Even though it's a federal offense, people still do it. Yes. Said it might be able to see that you could hack yourself from radar. Is this already being used in like military plane technology? I don't know, but it, stealth technology has been there for, for a while. It's pretty much a mature technology. But when you go into the military side, there are measures and then there are countermeasures and there are countermeasures for the countermeasures. So the radars that operate for military purposes do not function necessarily like the regular radars. They usually have, like if you example, if you take a pulse trailer, which has a large bandwidth, there is no cloak, metamaterial cloak, that can hide it from the large bandwidth. Yes. As far as being a selective absorber, um, does it have to reflect it somewhere? Like it can't just take it in? So is, is an absorber necessarily a reflector? Not necessarily. An absorber can 
take the wave in and then dissipate the power in terms of heat. And that's pretty much what the electro other electromagnetic absorbers like the, I don't know how far I need to go back to show this one, like those blue <coughs> pyramids things. those absorbers, mm -hmm. they do not reflect the electromagnetic wave, they just dissipate them as heat. There's other <coughs> really interesting applications. I was curious about the flat periscope, if that's a passive or active device. That's a passive device. That's a fully passive device. Really just neat. captures the incident wave, traps it on the surface for a while, and then releases it at a different location. How deep is this? One-tenth of a wavelength. What would be an application for that? For instance, if you have, like, if you have a, an antenna, if you want to build an antenna that operates at high frequency, and there is no way to take that received power from the antenna and let it go over cables until the other side. So you have to capture that power and let it flow in a waveguide, sort of a flat waveguide, until it goes to another location. That would be one possible application. At higher frequencies. At higher frequencies, yes. All right. Uh, if there are uh, uh, no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Salem for his very interesting, really, uh, talk. I mean, I really learned a lot. I'm afraid to all of you. So uh, uh, let's give him a hand. Right?